Um, it's been a difficult study for me because this is really a hybrid scenario uh, as an oil and gas exploration guy to look at such a difficult environmental scenario and I consider it to be an environmental disaster. Um, right up front, it's hard to understand, it's hard to control, and it's hard to predict. With all the experts in the room, from DNR to CBNI to Texas Brines experts, if it was that easy, we would have said, here's the roadmap and this is what it looks like. And I think from the very beginning, uh, this was illustrated as being the 3D seismic is going to be the end-all, be-all. It's going to be a panacea. It's a tool. That's basically what I wanted to tell you. It's a very high-resolution tool for finding oil and gas with a little bit more uh, commercial success, as we see with offshore with the oil and gas platforms, oil and gas wells onshore. Um, but even today, I'm involved with a project down in South Texas, 300 square miles of 3D. Hundreds of million dollars spent on drilling for oil and gas in a resource play. I don't know if you know where that is, but that's where they have success well after well after well. Three dry holes in a row. It's not a panacea. It's a tool, and I, I want to put that out up front. So I really had six points that I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm just going to look at my uh, laptop as, and talk to you about them. And I'll walk you through as quick as I can, but also in as much detail as I can, and open the floor up for questions that you can just say, Don, what do you think of this? Um, with regard to the first one, the evaluation of the sinkhole. Basically what I see, I know this is, is a prop, but we know at the surface we have a sinkhole, I mean the, the lake that's formed above the sinkhole. And at the bottom of the sinkhole is a fairly shallow water-filled basin of about, what would you say, Gary, what is the, the latest size of that? 26 acres? Yeah, it's about, uh, in June it was 24 acres across. So you think about a 26 acre area, and below that area, better for me to talk with, with my hands. So we've got a, a lake at the top, but essentially what the seismic shows is you see the salt on, on, the, uh, on the seismic on one profile and you see layered reflectors. And these reflectors don't represent beds, but they represent interfaces between different layered rock. And on the, the left hand side, or on the, let's say, the western side of the salt dome, we have a lot of layered reflectors. And then as you come up underneath the sinkhole, you do have a cone that has very chaotic reflectors within it, which represents that there is disturbed sediments underneath the sinkhole. We just don't have a lake, and there's just a neck. We actually have a little cone, and it comes down about 1,200 feet to a neck where it interfaces with the salt. And then it becomes very, very narrow from about 1,200 feet down to approximately 3,000 feet, and then it widens a little bit. Not as wide as the sinkhole, but it does get out another four to 500 feet in, in size. So, narrower at the bottom, a neck in the middle, and wider at the top. So it is somewhat of a, an hourglass shape. So, the thing I wanted to tell you about this 3D seismic, it is a picture in time of what the subsurface looks like as of March 2013. It's a static picture. And the problem that I've been wrestling with here is that it's a dynamic situation. We have oil and gas coming to the surface. We have potentially gas zones liberating through this disturbed hourglass feature. And I see oil and gas small pockets, at least two probable ones and three possible ones, that are adjacent to this hourglass. And here's the wrestling issue. We have a static picture, but a moving target. So I can tell you that I see something in March, maybe eight acres in size, and a five-foot hydrocarbon zone. But is it there today? If I say, let's drill a well and drain that, and relieve that gas, 
We may drill a dry hole because it's already been liberated to the surface. So it's a four-dimensional issue that it's a very, very difficult thing to understand. And it's not very com it's not at all common in the oil and gas business because we look for hydrostatic traps, things that are just in place and do not move. We drill them, we set casing in there, we deplete them, we move on to the next project. This one we might drill may not be there because it's moving through the system. So on the first item underneath the sinkhole, it's about a 1,200-foot cone of disturbance that I see in the seismic. And if anybody wants to ask a little, or take a little peek before you see it on the, um, the internet tomorrow, I'll be able to sit here and talk to you about it a little bit later. But there'll be a lot of people around the screen, so hopefully that'll under, you'll understand uh, why now, it's going to be what's difficult. What's the volume of these potential zones? <laughs> Uh, and I, I work in acre feet, so this volume of this cone of disturbance would be about 11,000 acre feet. How many million stops is that? I would say on that, on that basis, I did the calculation, but it actually comes down to, um, I think, in the order of 450,000 cubic yards. Don't hold me to that. I'll have to bring out the calculator later, but I, I think in acre feet. So that's the first issue. An acre foot is 43,560 times one, right? So then take acre feet, divide that by 27. Bingo. Okay. I didn't bring that number out with me, so hopefully you can have that calculated by the morning. So <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, I'll just go. Th that's the first item. So let's questions on the first item. Have we checked deeper in the salt dome for gas? I understand. Uh, got a gas pocket about sixty thousand feet down. Uh, be leaking out of that coming up? This data was recorded only to three seconds, and three seconds of time is roughly in the neighborhood of about twelve thousand feet. So we do not have a record down to sixty thousand feet. So you that far? No, sir. So you're, so you're saying we got 450,000 cubic yards of gas? I can give you the actual number right, once but, I give but, you a calculator. But, but that's, but it's 450,000. It's, it's a volume. There's no gas in this that I can see. There are, this is an area of disturbance underneath the sinkhole. And in that area of disturbance, you have some faulting going through there. You have chaotic reflectors that represent disturbed material. There's nothing in the data, in the raw records or all the process data that I've been given from Texas Brine that would illustrate if there's any gas pockets in there. And again, I want to put in the factor that's a moving target. We know bubbles are coming to the surface and liberating and volatilizing to the atmosphere, so I cannot determine any pockets of gas within that cone, so just got, next to the disturbed rock you were asking us the volume in these potential gas zones. Is that right? No. Okay. Yeah, the volume I'm, of gas. I'm trying to figure out how much gas we got. You told us that's 45 million scuffs once. Those are two different issues. Okay. The volume I gave you then is what's in the aquifer now. The number he's going to give you is his approximate range so far of what may be in these possible. It's 11,200. 30 acre feet that I see is the upper part of okay. the hour. He wants to know how much gas are in the five gas zones. Approximate volume. Approximate volume in the five zones. The two probable ones are about 60 million cubic feet of gas. The, two, the three possible ones are 150 million cubic feet of gas. The, the volumes range the volumes range from 8 to 10 acres in size and the thicknesses of the zones represent anywhere from 5 to about 10 feet. That's the best interpretation I can make of these two probable and three possible. And I want to explain to you the, the level that I made. Possible ones, I see hydrocarbons by all the indicators of the volumes of the data that I've gotten from Texas Brine. That means there's an area that looks like it has saturation by all the seismic evidence and well evidence that I have. But it is so far away from the hourglass 
that it's only possible that we can go through a tortuous path to the hourglass and up to the surface. The probable ones are those areas of saturation that I see that are adjacent to this hourglass. And they have more probability of getting into it. The final level will be proven. I can't prove a pathway. I can't draw a highway marker from these gas zones that I see and tell you definitively that it goes from this gas pocket into the disturbed rock zone, up a conduit, comes into the sinkhole, and then goes laterally into the aquifer. That's a proven statement. I'll never be able to do that, and you won't find anybody in the business to tell you that either. All I can do is, like, if you are not an oil and gas operator, I'd say, drill here. And this is your most, your highest probability of finding oil and gas. Well, look, I, I, I don't want to monopolize the time, but sure. the volumes that you mentioned, 60 million cubic feet and 100 million cubic feet, that compares to the cavern, which used to have brine. No, it does not. About 90 million cubic feet. These volumes are hydrocarbons that are adjacent to the disturbed rock zone. Well, I understand. And they may have been there before the sinkhole occurred. So my point is, if you're talking about a volume, which is order of magnitude, like the volume of the cavern, which I maintain it is, then for goodness sakes, you want to be able to figure out whether it's got gas in it. Why can't you put a pipe down into it and get it out? That might be a possibility in the future, but that I hasn't mean, come up. I it's not yet. like it's a small postage stamp to drill into it. That's correct. None of these are commercial deposits. They are so small. But they, if they are present, and they but are... They are physically huge. That's physically huge. Uh, well, there is in the oil and gas sense, no. In an environmental sense, yes. In, in the sense of... The, you're talking about the number of cubic feet that were in the cavern. Which <coughs> the cavern is as big as the Empire State Building. I think we're confusing two issues. I haven't really talked about the cavern volume yet. We I jumped into that. oil and gas. I understand zones. that, but you said 60 to 100 million cubic feet, and the cavern is 90 million cubic feet. So I'm saying it's of the same Cubic feet order. of gas versus, I think that's 90 million cubic yards or cubic feet? No, it's cubic feet. It's, it's, it's 11 million barrels equivalent. Yeah. So my point is, is that the oil and gas did not come from the cavern. The oil and gas is present outside the salt, and it may have been present there before, but I see it in the 2013 data, and I have very poor data in the 2007 data to say it was there before, and it's there after it hasn't moved. So they are possible and probable zones. So are you seeing crude as well as gas? Oh, no, I just see a hydrocarbon event. And that's one of the problems with seismic. You have to go through and do some more modeling to identify and determine what is a gas hydrocarbon, a gas zone, and an oil zone versus a water zone. And there are ways to do that, but not with the data that I have delivered to me today. All I can say is this is a probable hydrocarbon zone. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say this is its equivalent size in gas. Getting all right. Uh, Bob, you're right on the volumes. One of the things the Blue Ribbon Commission is going to look at now that we've got a good picture of the subsurface is the question you just asked. Is it going to be feasible to drill into these and intercept the gas before it comes to the surface? That's, we needed a good foundation to start with. Now the next step is to look at the viability of doing that. Uh, and so that is on the agenda. It's on the Blue Ribbon Commission list of things we're going to take a look at. 